Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and we're excited to have with us today the Reverend Dr. Charlie Dates. Charlie became the youngest senior pastor at Progressive Baptist Church of Chicago in 2011 at age 30. He teaches preaching at Wheaton College, among other institutions. Among other institutions. Among others, right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Charlie's widely sought after for conferences, summits, retreats, board memberships, and guest pulpits. But before we hear from Charlie, let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine, Executive Director of the Wheaton College, Billy Graham Center. Now, if you don't know, uh, Pastor Charlie and I are friends, and we're exci- I'm super excited about this conversation. Um, I've actually been in a class when uh, when Dr. Dates pr- uh, taught preaching. Matt Chandler, was in, Matt Chandler was in that class, too. Here's what he said. That class opened up a whole new world of preaching to me. I don't think I've actually gotten over it yet. This is from Chandler, a text we and I exchanged said, my zeal for the craft of preaching was ignited, and my preparation to preach changed from that class. More heat for faithfulness and passion than I came in with, and I feel like I came in with quite a bit. I would say Matt Chandler mm-hmm. came in with quite a bit. So mm-hmm. so we're excited to talk about preaching to uh, one of the, the preachers who are setting the conversation today, and that's uh, Charlie Dates. So we're going to focus on preaching. If you're, if you're, you know, we're pastors and church staff, so a lot, if not most of you, are preaching. Some of you are not, but I want you to stay with us. We're going to, it's going to apply to teaching as well, but it's also a conversation I think is important when we talk about preaching. So, Charlie, how did you first discover that God had called you to preach? I was that kid who sat on the edge of the seat in adult worship service saying to my mom, I, I got to do what that guy up there is doing. No lie. True story. The, uh, at my mother's home going, uh, that pastor was at the service and he told a joke about he remembered the first time he met my mom and my brothers and he kept meeting me every Sunday because I would mm-hmm. run up to the pulpit when service was over and pull him on uh, his coattail and say, hey, man, when are you going to let me preach? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ed and Daniel, that's the earliest memory I have. And it's as early as any memory that I have. There was a conscious registration in my mind and in my heart that I was born to do this. Now, I will say times have tried uh, that conviction uh, that that is to give my attention elsewhere. But but that conviction, which I think everybody who does preach or teach needs, that conviction has not waned. It is won over every trial and every circumstance that has come my way. Mm. Charlie, really quick question. How old were you when you preached your first sermon? 17. And I would have been 12 if they had let me, but, you know, they had some wisdom and kind of held me off. And the more I think about it, uh, the the pastor of the Mount Calvary Church, uh, Craig Brown, he scheduled me to preach for the first time the Sunday before I left for undergrad. So I'm going away to college and he knew exactly what he was doing. There was no chance for me to preach or to go in here. So it was just like, let him get it out of his system and go to school and that was it. So it was, I think the craft of building a preacher has to have some elements of hurry up and wait in it. You can't mm-hmm. just give a preacher everything right out at the gate. I think there needs to be a mixing in of deliberate and intentional, um, a slower pace, if you will, or intentional waiting. It, it does something to demonstrate the sense of urgency and call that one possesses. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's go back to that moment. You're 17, probably still in high school. Think back, like, how did you prepare for that <laughs> sermon? How, how did it go? The, the lead up? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say that no preacher is completely original in and of herself or himself. So how did it go? I would say it was, as it kind of is today, uh, multiple rivers, a compilation of influences and voices helping me frame or to discern my own. So I prepared, uh, this is at a time, by the way, when the the pastor took critical attention to the manuscript and the outline of the emerging preacher. So I I didn't just get up there. I, I had to turn in a draft maybe three times. We worked through it. And at that point, I had some confidence that it was going to work. 
because he had seen it multiple times. I love and it that. wasn't until he signed off on it that I actually got permission to, to stand up. So, yeah, 17, that actually graduated high school, was was going into my freshman year at the University of Illinois. And, and you know how it went? Let me say this. Those people prayed for me. <laughs> they They stood there with me. And I think what happened was, and I miss this about the church. I really do. They sensed potential and promise mm. and where they could have just shut me down and pointed out all the flow, flaws and the error in my mechanics or even in, in some of my content. They stood with me and they encouraged me and they cheered me on. So I heard that sermon. I found it in oh, wow. 2020. Oh, wow. And uh, I will never, if it's up to me, let it out for anybody <laughs> else to hear. Um, but you can hear in that young preacher the, the seeds of promise. You can see some of the sprouting, so to speak, uh, that, that was there. I love the fact that they, like, we went over the message with you three times. I, I remember my first attempt at teaching and preaching. I actually was canceled because I, I was on a youth group mission trip, new, new relative and new believer. I was excited about it, and then I, I ended up getting in an argument or a fight with somebody, and they canceled it. So I don't even remember when I actually did it, but I do remember that nobody gave me any practice so um, or, or review or anything of that sort. So um, I, I want to come back to that in a minute because I really want to talk about sure. you know raising up of new preachers. But um, you know, fast forward a few years since that 17-year-old kid yeah. uh, broke open a sermon. Uh, uh, how do you prepare today? What does your sermon preparation look like now? It's ongoing. I think that's one of the challenges of, of pastoring and preaching in the way that I do. Uh, from the best uh, that I can render, and I'm planning series, forecasting a year in advance, but planning them closer seasonally. So that all in these days, I'm not just preaching like through the book of Romans, which I've done. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing in prayer a burden and then compiling passages that meet along a theme. So I'm ahead of the game on an average week in terms of knowing where I'm going for me. And I would encourage anyone listening uh, to you. I start with the text. And I don't I try not to come to the text with an idea already formulated in my mind. But I want to I want to clear the slate, even though I've read the scriptures and read through them. I, I want the Holy Spirit to speak to me anew and afresh. And so I'm saying that to the to the Holy Spirit, let me down into the treasure of your word and show me what I have not seen before. So I'm probably translating a text on an average week and building out what we call an exegetical outline. Now that's, that's big stuff these days, you know, cause, and I ain't taking shots at nobody, but I want you to hear me. Some people are making it up uh, when, when they get to the pulpit. And part of my aim is to say, I don't want to make it up. I, I want to sit under the authority of God's word. Cause I believe that changes lives. So I want to see if I can unearth as best I can recreating the narrative of the world around the text What's the original meaning? And I do think there's meaning in the text. How did the original recipients hear it? And from that, in essence, I'm building a parallel homiletical outline. So the exegetical outline is just straight Bible names, Bible facts, narrative details. The homiletical outline is thinking more generically in terms of categories of people and people groups. And then I, I try to work with the situational grid. I think through in pastoral preaching, the types of people who are here. Sometimes it's easy to preach to a church that doesn't exist. Um, and on these days online, you can preach to a church you think you have. I'm, I'm trying to preach to the people I know are there and not excluding others who are watching, but how might the fifth grader, you know, who's sitting with their dad today receive the application of this text? Or how might the uh, young adult who just moved to Chicago and uh, has a great new job take it? And, and then how might a senior citizen view it? So I am trying to weave into the sermon writing process a net that's wide enough to catch everybody, but a message that is tailored and specific enough for where we live right now. All right. So we, you can't you can't separate the uh, the 
preacher from the person. So let's talk about you real quick, Charlie. Uh, you, you served in campus ministry while you were in college student. Uh, you were an apprentice pastor in Rockford. You were with Dr. James Meeks as a pastoral intern. And then at 31, I mean, that's real young to become a senior pastor of a historic church uh, in Chicago. Think about those moments uh, throughout your formation, who you were, uh, what you were experiencing. What are the key lessons that you learned about preparing and delivering sermons during that time? So got her along the way. That's cool. That's a good idea. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So I will say this. I, it's like correction. I had just had my 30th birthday coming okay. into the progressive church. The reason that's important you know, at, is at my age, it doesn't seem much of a difference, 30 to 31, but no, maybe at your age it does. No, let me tell you, it's, <laughs> it's significant. Every year counts. It's like dog years in one sense, but they kicked my tail at this church, man, mm. when I first got here. So you talk about forming and shaping the preacher. I think the church does that. Now, I don't say that like with joy. I'm very grateful now for that. But from uh, undergrad through uh, with Pastor Copeland and Rockford to, to the time with Pastor Meeks at Salem, uh, I came to learn that people would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. That there is a high regard for the quality of life uh, that uh, that the preacher possesses. Now, that that in no way is no aspiration toward perfection or saying that any of us get it all right. I certainly get a lot wrong, but I I am trying to walk with God myself. Um, I forget who it was, if it was George uh, Whitfield or Wesley, uh, who who is reported to essentially have believed so much what he preached that unbelievers showed up to hear him because they believed that he believed. Hmm. And and that is that's the conviction that I want to to have. Not that I'm crazy, but that the word I proclaim actually is reading me. I'm not just reading it. It has taken me and I'm not just taking a hold of it. So that's where it starts. Uh, my life is a laboratory for the word of God. It is, it is where in my marriage and in my parenting and in my pastoral leadership and in, in my, the private recesses of my heart, God does his surgical work so that there is some authenticity uh, behind the words th that I proclaim. That's how I would answer that question, Damon. Love it. So we're going to, uh, you're going to, you, I've seen you teach preaching and uh, I was in and out of that class as you know, I don't remember what it was, but there was some, something I was, got stuck in the middle of a little national, whatever. Um, and, but I got to see part of it and you're of course teaching for us this fall, next fall uh, in our, in our different, our masters, in our, our demon program. Um, one of the things that, um, and I, Matt, you, you know, the, text from Matt, I, I don't think I've shared it with you. I shared it with you for the first time right here. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think a lot of the conversation was just the remarkable ability you had to communicate how to preach, which is not just your remarkable preacher, but how to preach. It's not usual. You know, there are some people who are remarkable teachers of preaching. You're both that and a, and a powerful preacher. Um, but also, too, I think a lot of our students, and there was a mix of students in there. I, I'm trying to remember about uh, 30, maybe 25, 30% were African-American. Um, but for the majority of the class, black preaching was being introduced to them in ways. And you, you played clips and we talked some about that. So talk to us about pre preaching in the African-American context, black preaching, um, and what, because most of our listeners just percentage-wise are not going to be African-American. Sure, sure. Why engage in that space? Because it was such a gift when you did in that class. Yeah, well, well I, need, I do need to say thank you, and uh, I need to follow up with those pastors uh, to, to be sure that I didn't get any of them put out of their churches. But the um, part of the formation, the theological formation that most students experience at, say, uh, Bible schools or colleges that have a high view of Scripture, is that we are given one way to do theology. And the, the problem with that is the one group that uh, authorizes that curriculum or that way tends to be white men. And no, nothing against white men. It just it is what it is. I want to thank I, you for that. I want to yeah, thank but, you for that. But, but I think the failure in that is, yeah. that is that theology and doctrine and the formulation of doctrine and the interrelationship between doctrine lead to very different emphasis depending upon who's doing it. And so we have missed entire gaps of application in American Christian preaching because we bend toward one angle right. uh, of the spectrum. And so what I tried to do in 
in that class. And what I would urge others to consider is to round out the more robust uh, aspect of preaching in the local church. If, if you can have your favorites, of course, but if all you listen to are the same white guys, then your preaching is just going to become stale. It's going to be the same uh, rhythm and, and fragrance, as it were. But if you can listen to the heartbeat of theological reflection from other ethnic camps, then it's going to bring some color to your preaching, pun intended. It's, it's going to enrich and make a 4D Ultra K uh, the, the kind of preaching that you want to convey. For instance, the narrative homiletic in African-American preaching is second to none. The ability of the black preacher to tell the story historically to Gardner Taylor and other E.K. Bailey, who we listen to, and, and then the ability to just kind of flat foot stand on your feet and engage toward a uh, broader corporate social application. Frederick Douglass Haynes, uh, James Meeks uh, are some voices there. And, and then the, uh, the ability to be, sometimes we preach down and I get it. You know, some people are like, we want to make it accessible, but I think you can make preaching accessible and still preach up. And th that's a Ralph Douglas West, uh, as it were for me. And then you get a Priscilla Shire who just got all the gifts uh, in some ways and just has the ability to, to say anything and, and it sounds good. God has just uniquely wired her uh, to be able to connect on multiple levels at the same time. All of that, believe it or not, it finds its root in the African-American uh, story. Yeah. It's so some people go, oh, can't all human beings do that? Sure. But I but I think 250 years of chattel slavery, uh, 14 years of failed reconstruction, 73 years of Jim Crow. And now the new Jim Crow ha has turned the perch from which black people experience life and therefore the perch from which black people experience the gospel. Mm. It's the same gospel, but it really does lead to different emphasis. And so if you would diversify and incorporate into your hearing uh, the voices of some of the, the best of black preaching, I can guarantee you, your, your preaching will graduate. Okay, so we're going to link all those names uh, in, Great. in the show notes so people can find those. Um, some, some they'll recognize. But okay, so you mentioned the, the experience of, you know, you grew up in an African-American context. You've been shaped by African-American preaching. Um, but that shapes, because it's the culture from which you're preaching, so help me a little more though. So what value is it then for me or for Daniel, uh, both of whom who didn't grow up in that kind of context, so we don't have the same experience from which to preach that you, you articulated a moment ago that's really essential to that experience. What can we take from that that is still helpful to us and in us as preachers? Yeah, so I don't think you wanna do what Rick Robinson calls a culture grab. Like Kirk Franklin will often say, you know, we set pop culture and people come to us basically to see what's cool. You and you, you don't want to be the kind of person who's just like, oh, I heard Charlie Dates do this, so I'm going to try it. What you're listening for or what somebody like you and Daniel could do who do not come from our experience is to find the relationship between the way I would preach this passage and the way you would okay. and discern some distinctions. And from that, start to ask the questions, what might lead to these conclusions on my side? You know, am I only reading John MacArthur or am I only reading uh, the Baker exegetical commentary series? Uh, but so that I lead to the same kind of conclusions and, and then get in dialogue with some other non like you kind of preachers to hear how they process the text. B because although it's the same text and although it, it offers the same truth, it is layered in its application. And I think that you and I could land at more helpful points of explanation and illustration for that matter and application by discerning the distinctions within the voices. Charlie, what, what are some of the qualities that you admire in other preachers that maybe have a different style from you and maybe even a different tradition? You can hear it already in this pocket, a concision of speech. Yeah. I, I greatly admire preachers who can say a lot more than I do with far fewer words. I, I also greatly appreciate those who 
uh, incorporate what I call a sensory reading of the text. And, and that is uh, to slow down and to see what you smell, what you feel, what you taste. Uh, I, I've been so slow. I preached, I preached this past Sunday, uh, a text at Luke 19, where Jesus, we call it the triumphal entry. It might be the tragic entry when you think about it, but where Jesus goes into Jerusalem and I listened to other preachers uh, when I was done, handle that same text. And I just am amazed at the way that that donkey is turned and interpreted in that mm. passage. And so I admire preachers who can take a picture in a text, the narrative exploration of it, turn it like a diamond and demonstrate the varying facets on that diamond and how they preach. Mm -hmm. I could say, I could give you an example. So for Sunday, I argued that uh, maybe Jesus was authorizing the donkey jacking. I don't know. I mean, think about it. He says, you know, you're going to go, you're going to see this donkey. And when they ask you, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> you're going to say the Lord hath need of it. And so I told the story, you know, to the church, if you go out to the parking lot today and somebody is uh, wiring your car and they've broken into it and they're getting it started and provided you could get this out of your mouth without using other words, you say to them, what are you doing? You look back at them and, and they say, the Lord hath need of your car. <laughs> and, and just in that moment, part of what I was trying to say is Jesus is Lord over stuff you think you own. Mm. And, and also this donkey, this sterile offspring between a mule and a mare uh, is a beast of burden. You know, he's not a glorious deed. We know all of those things. But when you look at the text, I, start, I listen to other people. This donkey has never been written. You know, Jesus is able to take wild creation and make it submit to his domain and the accessibility of riding a donkey. This is where I'll finish on this point is what I admire. Kirsty and I saw Mr. Obama couple of times, but once we were sitting at the corner of First and Independence in D.C. at the Rayburn building, and he was riding off in a motorcade. And I don't know if you guys have been close to one of those motorcades before, but there's like four or five Suburbans on the back end. They got these big guns pointed out at you. And I thought to myself, impressive, but unapproachable. And when you look at that donkey that Jesus is riding on, you listen to a variety of preaching. I admire the fact that people could point out that it, that he's accessible. Um, so that's a whole sermon Come on. on just the donkey. All right. Not, not even the rest of the, the, the narrative there. Just, just that. All right. So come back to us, uh, sermon prep. And I want to come back to that being a young preacher, maybe, or, yeah, I guess it could be applicable to anybody. Um, what are some misconceptions, maybe common mistakes that you've noticed among younger pastors or pastors in general in the sermon prep part of the journey? What would you encourage them to mistakes to avoid? One mistake is to um, not read the text enough. So I'm about to say something really strange, but 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 I'm not sure that based on some of the preaching I'm hearing that people actually like read the Bible a lot. It is a benefit to read that passage like 20 times yeah. before you get to work on it. A common mistake is thinking you know everything that there is to know in there before you get to it. And we, we suggest that subliminally by rushing to writing application rather than just kind of sitting in it and letting the Holy Spirit reveal it. The other thing I think is there's a heavy emphasis on exegeting the text in some of our seminaries, not enough emphasis on exegeting the people and exegeting culture. I, I would urge younger preachers, while you got that lens, especially, and while you know who the music artists are and, and what's on TikTok and this and the other, pay attention to culture. Don't preach it, but see how the timeless truth of scripture explains culture and explains where, where we are. I would to God, man, in many ways, that some of my preaching I could do over the last 10 years, because mm. some of it, as I go back to listen to it, is so technical and right. it is it it is so rigid. I was trying to be, and I'm sure I was being faithful to the best of my ability, that I didn't take time to breathe and read people. Mm. And 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 we got a mutual friend whose name I won't call Ed, but he said to me, anybody you know can crack a text like a math formula, but it takes somebody special to be able to crack people and mm. to be able to help show people where they live at in, in that text. So those are some common mistakes I would make. Yeah, I would it's, suggest. It's, 
<laughs> it seems that, and I think I know that common person, it seems that some preachers are remarkable good at cracking that person. So they're exactly good at engaging and connecting with people and maybe exegeting the culture. And other people seem to be really good at exegeting the text. It sounds like you yes. were maybe earlier on, you know, perhaps because of the journey you were on in theological yeah. education and more. Um, it was more, you know, technical. I, I, I long for preachers to find and walk in that both end space. Sure. Yeah. But it seems that um, they people struggle being in that both end space, letting yeah. the text drive a message. I'm, I'm doing the um, exegetical homiletical lectures at Wycliffe College uh, uh. that I'm preparing for right now up in University of Toronto. And, you know, it's like this, I, I'm sort of like, I'm going to stand in front of these people, and there's going to be a whole bunch of people every time I say, you got to engage the Bible more. They're going to be like, yeah. And they're the yeah. people who need to probably hear, you got to engage the culture more. Yeah. And then the people I'm saying got to engage the culture more, they're like, yeah. And I'm like, no, no, you got to <laughs> engage the Bible more. So yes. I don't really know. I, I probably fail more than I succeed at trying to figure out how to do this. So how do we help people to do both? That yeah. Both end approach? Yes. Again, and I think, and for your class, one of the best things you can do is to put examples of people yeah. who do both in, in front of them, because some of this is caught more than it is taught. S some of it is just discerned and you pick it up, you listen to it enough, you get it. But when we see Jesus preach, all right, if we slow down and look at Jesus in the New Testament, he is a master storyteller. He talks a lot about people and circumstances. And then he goes on to make his kingdom principle or to levy his theological proposition in the midst of all of that. Can I just interrupt it, him? You know, kingdom principle, theological proposition. I think just he talks in alliteration. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I, did, I wasn't even thinking about it. it you but, don't even think yeah. about it. That's the point. This is what happens <laughs> yeah. when you get this practice. But keep going. Keep going. Yeah. So so I, I even think the way Jesus handles the scripture, he will say, you have heard it said, mm -hmm. but I say to you. Um, and, and he's showing us that the real power in preaching the text is not just an explanation of what it meant to those people, but he's saying, this is how it lives today. He mm -hmm. honors what it meant to those people, but he says, no, but it points to something even more than that. So I, I think for the, when you get to that crowd and when we talk to people like that, we say, well, let's listen to the preaching of Jesus and, and let's hear him wrestle with the ideas of his day. And that is an encouragement to us to know what the heck is going on in the world today mm. and to demonstrate that connection. The other thing that I would say is, is very uh, common at some of our more progressive schools. And I ain't throwing shade at nobody. Like I listen to people all ac across the way. Rather than starting with the canon, they start with culture. And it's common for some of the more conservative schools to start with the canon and, and then maybe to go to culture if ever. I, I want to suggest that, that if I had it to do all over again to it, it's better to be technical with the canon as yep, a start. The canon of scripture. Yeah. Yep, with the canon of scripture. It's better to be technical there, almost like a jazz musician. And then get around some other musicians who teach you how to pull off and, and to improvise as you go along. Uh, to not do that, uh, to play either extreme, is to either invite legalism or compromise, in my opinion. And I think that truth and grace piece that Jesus describes himself as shows up in how we exegete culture and the church. You need both. You mentioned Holy Spirit earlier. And I've heard Charlie preach the same sermon in two different occasions, two different rooms. Yeah. And both times, like, felt the Holy Spirit empowering you. You would say Holy Ghost when you're preaching. Um, oh, yeah. And um, and then I've 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 watched your sermons on YouTube, the same sermon twice, and still feel the you know that the power of God going through. So I want you to talk about the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you're a manuscript preacher. Sometimes I feel like you are because I've heard two sermons and you know very similar uh, openings, and yet you're still uh, not so rigid that the Holy Spirit is working in a very fluid way. Can you talk about that dynamic? First of all, I'm mad that you heard me preach the same sermon in different spaces. We got to fix that. Um, if you're not <laughs> no, in person. No, 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 back, back this up. Back this up. Yeah. There is nothing wrong yeah. with preaching the same sermon in different Absolutely. places. 
clearly I do it all the time. Yeah, there's nothing wrong think, with you. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but I'm just saying. Wait, I, let me say, in both times, like I said, it was powerful. And it yeah. wasn't just you. Yeah. It was the spirit was moving. Yeah, yeah do people and, ask you, like, could you preach that sermon again? Do you get that? Because I get that. Do you get that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I just, it doesn't work like that. You know, okay. it just, it doesn't work like that. That's what all I All right, so back to respond. his question. Yes. So the... I am Trinitarian, all right, for whatever that's worth. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I was kind of hoping. I was kind of hoping. <laughs> so <laughs> we should have checked this before. <laughs> listen, let me tell you, because it ain't clear on everybody. And, and part of what that means is I believe that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is part of the Godhead. And I believe what Jesus says in John that he was going to pray that another comforter would come who would remind us of, of all truth. Now, listen, th this means that the activity of God has not ceased among humanity. And so I'm relying on the Holy Spirit in preparation to reveal to me what I cannot see on my own. All right. That's, that's where it starts. And then I'm praying like Spurgeon prayed. You know, they said he had 15, 17 steps going up to that pulpit at Metropolitan Tabernacle and every landing of every step he would, he would pray. I believe in the Holy spirit. I believe in the Holy spirit every Sunday. Just about, I'm going up this. I believe in the Holy ghost. I believe in the, I believe that you're able to do something that far exceeds even what these people have gathered for. So in the preparation, there is room being made for the Holy spirit. And I am praying that God would run this text through the, through my heart, like blood courses through my veins. But in that moment, I'm learning, Daniel. I cannot say that I've learned this or mastered it. I'm learning to trust the spirit of God as pockets open in preaching and not to be tied to my manuscript. Mm -hmm. I do write more of a manuscript, sometimes an annotated outline, but, but I'm looking for that kind of hot off the press, Lord, give it to me in the moment. Uh, because I fill my heart and my mind with the best of preparation that I can, but I'm reserving space for you. And sometimes, Daniel, sometimes people will come to me when the sermon is over and say, you know, the part that really touched me was this part. And I have to say to myself, that wasn't even written in there. <laughs> it, it turns out that what was most meaningful to you was not what I had yep. written down. Yep. Yep. And then I just go, all right, well, I know who I work for. And uh, and I'm good. Mm. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. You say you go up there with a manuscript or annotated outline. Um, how long do you preach? I mean, I mean, that's typically on a Sunday. The last two Sundays, uh, I've been at 30 minutes and 33 minutes. Wow, that's not and, uh, usual. But I'm I'm my life is changing. You know, I can't preach as long as I as I used to. I gotta manage uh, responsibilities and such. Yeah, totally, totally. So um, so how many you say manuscript annotated outline? How many pages is 35 minutes for Charlie Dates? Six pages Six. Oh, okay so that's yeah. not then that's not a manuscript at the speed you speak so that's going to be some places manuscript some places are outlined right yeah yeah and it depends on where COVID preaching to a camera pushed yeah. me to a discipline of a word count it, it basically because I didn't have in the black preaching tradition it preaching is dialogical all right mm -hmm. so there is this kind of dance between the pulpit and the people that's um, fair yeah. And and so in that rhythm, you're not just running through a line, you know, you, you kind of teasing it out and and you are hanging on to a word and then you're playing it back or then you're leaning in. When the people left, it was like preaching in a white church every week in one sense. It was no offense. I'm sorry. You might want to X that out. Uh, with, <laughs> you know, we're, we're with, OK. We're OK. OK. All right. It, but it was like nobody saying anything. back Right. To right. And, and so my passion and my enthusiasm was still there. I just had to write in a way that helped me to keep going, that made the transitions and the turns super clear because I had no feedback, no live interaction. Boy, man, I think I'm going to have to see a therapist at some point about that. I think that did something to my preaching, man. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All of us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Charlie, as we wrap up here, um, I'm thinking about uh, preachers that have really kind of developed a bad rep for, you know, those faithful gospel preachers. I mean, I, you know, I won't name any names, but it's all over Twitter and Facebook and social media. And uh, especially because, you know, there is a performative element in preaching. Sure. But there's that line you cross when you're merely performing and you're no longer preaching. 
Hmm. And as we wrap up here, you know, can you speak to that? Can you exhort uh, those who are going to be preaching this week who, yeah, this, there is a performative element, but how do you not cross that line? Gee, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for the easy closing question. Yeah, yeah. Well, he likes to, he's, he was saving that one to just serve it up at the end. It's not even in our notes. He just came up with that on his own. Not even in our notes. Well, I wish you had called names because it would help me to narrow in, but I understand why we cannot. I, I would say that the New Testament, excuse me, picture of a herald or a heralder is one who comes to the center square, city square, and proclaims a word from the king. They're not a court jester. They are a heralder. Mm -hmm. I imagine, though, even then, to do that required voice inflection, facial expression, hand gestures, uh, and all kinds of eye contact and nonverbal communication to connect with, with people. Human beings are complex creatures. We are not simply auditory listeners. We feel what we hear as it combines very often when, with what you see. And so the preacher has to be able to deliver as if the word has a hold of her or him. All right. That's really important. So when you say performative, I understand what you're saying. I just want to delineate or create a distinction between a performance and what is performative. Uh, preaching itself is not a performance. The act of preaching is performative. That, that being said, any and everything useful to the ear and the eye can become free game when it, when it comes to preaching. However, however, the preacher has to make a distinction or to draw the line at when whatever they are doing draws more attention to them than it does to the subject matter at which they're speaking. I have often, and, to, and this was no fault of my own, lost momentum in preaching because something else happened in the sanctuary that pulled all of our attention away from what I was doing. I can't control that. I can control when it's me, when I'm the one pulling the attention away from what's actually supposed to be coming alive in the sanctuary. So I ask myself, what, is, what in the scripture is simply to be described and what is to be lived out again? And there's a difference between extracting a principle, you know, from a text and applying that versus actually trying to do what you see in scripture. I tend to stay away from trying to repeat some of the things that we've seen in scripture, even from the pulpit. And I'd like to use words to craft the story rather than to use actions in a performative kind of way that detracts from the story. So I have a discipline, man, and part of it is her name is Kirsty Dates, and <laughs> she will say to me, "Hey, bruh, uh, that was, Amen. you know, okay, but but that ain't that ain't cool." And sometimes I've learned, and I know everybody listening to me isn't married or per se, but it is. You do have the benefit of people who love you and who listen to you to say, "Hey, I'm thinking about communicating this in this way," and then let them give you feedback. You don't necessarily have to do what they say. But I'm gonna tell you I, that has saved my um, that, I say no. that has saved my black behind a number of times uh, from from doing something very tragic and harmful for to my own reputation. Hope that Passing helps. Passing and encouraging. Oh, it's, it very much is. Last word. And um, what would your exhortation be um, to preachers and teachers of God's word in the cultural? calamity that we're all walking through, the cultural convulsion we're all walking through. Give us a closing word of exhortation. Don't give up. Ah, the worst of times needs the best of Christian preaching. I fight tears saying this. These, these are the times where people are more open to the supernatural than ever. And if you read it any other way, you're wrong. Trust me when I tell you the world is hungry for living bread. Don't give up. Stay at it. Keep your feet at the fire. And in due season, you will reap if you faint not. Hold on, my brother. Hold on, my sister. Just keep preaching.
Amen. You've been listening to the Reverend Dr. Charlie Dates. You can learn more about him and his ministry at ProgressiveChicago.org, and you can find more interviews with the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast, as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review that will help other ministry leaders find and benefit from our content more easily. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.